look a little more deeply into one story, into several facets of a story in the news today, because I think it might tell us what's happening more broadly. And it's a story of a woman called Amanda Gorman, who is a poet. Uh, she's 23. When she was 22, she gave the inaugural poem at President's, Pre President Biden's inauguration. The key thing to know about Amanda Gorman is that she is the representative of an oppressed group. That mm. is the way uh, we are introduced to her in, in every profile. Amanda Gorman, in addition to be call, being called Amanda, uh, is the product of the most expensive private school in Los Angeles, $42,000 a year for 13 years, Harvard College for four years, a semester abroad in Spain, all paid for by others, no student debt. In what sense is she oppressed? <laughs> well, obviously the age we live in has a strange value system. Uh, many of us grew up in societies where we admired people who were brave uh, or heroic, uh, who strove to uh, show people the way to be brave in their lives. Uh, in our own lifetimes, this has changed. Uh, now, if you want to be a leader, you have to uh, show that you are an oppressed minority. You have to show suffering. You have to show beleaguerment, that everything's been done against you. Uh, people are meant to not admire heroism, but to admire suffering. And so we have created a Suffering Olympics, where even very, very privileged people uh, wish people not to recognize their privilege, but rather to think of them as being downtrodden. And this is just this era's uh, passport to elite success. It does seem like sometimes the most privileged spend the most time telling us that they're oppressed. And I guess that's what's so bewildering as you watch this. Yes, and uh, of course it's an impossible game because we could um, point out that this is nonsense. We could just say, I don't recognize your, your right to claim victimhood. You seem not to me to be a victim. But then there are clever little things you can do as a part of that. You can, say if, you can say back to that, well, I'm part of X oppressed group. So even though I might have been lucky in my life, uh, I'm part of a group that can give me the passport to elite success by being um, oppressed. Uh, there are other ones like this. People can say, oh, I've got mental health, as if everybody else doesn't have any mental health issues. You can do various things like this. But the point is to show yourself to be the most oppressed person so that you win so that you win, and then you can tell everyone else what to do. And Amanda Gorman has this, uh, 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 to an extraordinary extent, it's almost as if it's, it, uh, the whole thing of her uh, doing this alleged poem, just a list of banalities really at the inauguration, was almost uh, just, I dare you, I dare you to criticize this work. There were people, there were people who criticized the poem who immediately were lambasted for criticizing it. How dare you criticize the poem? Uh, uh, Amanda Gorman, by any normal uh, measure, has, as you pointed out, had a much luckier life than almost anybody in America. But if you point out that even you don't like the poem, it doesn't seem to rhyme, doesn't seem to scan, doesn't seem to be memorable, uh, you're doing that against somebody you're not meant to criticize because the person you're criticizing can claim oppression. This is an irreducible game. I mean, we could all play it. It's just that I think decent people wouldn't and shouldn't. What does it do to art? I mean, if you care about, I actually like poetry, and I think it's, it's interesting, it's important, it's difficult to write. If you tell a population this is beauty, this is art, when it's so obviously not, what does that do to art? Well, uh, um, our age has decided that beauty isn't very important. Uh, it's decided that uh, political banality is of utmost importance. Uh, that your life will be find meaning if uh, you demonstrate and wave placards and much more. I think this is a horrible view of life. It's a radical left view of life that thinks that you'll find meaning by uh, protesting and yelling. Um, these people forget that actually I think nobody on their deathbeds looks back at their life and thinks, I wish I'd have attended that protest. I wish I'd made more <laughs> placards. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been good? Uh, no, uh, most people on the deathbeds uh, regret they didn't spend more time with loved ones. Yes. Um, so uh, the whole sense of what's important in our society has changed radically and in an ugly direction. Uh, it makes everything political. It wants to politicize everything. It wants to politicize art. It wants to politicize poetry. Uh, all, all of the things that were meaningful in our lives have been picked up and spun through this cycle of politics. And it's boring. 
it's ugly, and I think that it's the job of any sensible person to say, I, I refute this. I refuse to join in this game. I refuse to have this vision of life. I have a better vision of life and how it should be lived, and we should assert that. I want to get into that in much greater detail, but I want to ask you one last question about this Amanda Gorman story. And by the way, I'm not attacking Amanda Gorman, whom I don't know, and I always admire young people who are successful, you know, almost no matter what they do. However, there was a story in the New York Times yesterday about a new controversy surrounding her work, and it's this. Foreign publishers, her, her poem is apparently about to drop 150,000 copies, I think by Viking, um, and it is being translated into other languages, Dutch among them. And mm. the Dutch publisher hired a Dutch translator to translate the poem mm. into Dutch, yes. but the Dutch translator was white and was fired for that. Only a black person can translate a black person's poem. Yes. What does that tell you about where we're going? I think also, didn't the Dutch translator, it was, they were thought to be perfect for the job because um, the Dutch translator is a they, them person. Right. Had, had come out as, um, as non-binary or, or, or look at me, as, as I say. Uh, the, the translator had come out as they, them, and so therefore should be perfect to do the translation. Except that then it turned out that the translator was white. Now, if that's the road we're heading down, this is a dark, dark road. Uh, you, can, you can play racial equality, but uh, the only alternative is racial supremacy. Racial supremacy runs if you believe that one group actually ruins things by even being. And this current form of racial supremacy that's running rife across America asserts not just that uh, black people and white people are equal, it now says, it's now moved to the next stage, which is to say, actually, white people spoil everything. They wreck things. They, they, they can't even be a translator in Dutch of a black person's poem because they will ruin it. Now, there are several problems about this. One is, it's just flat out racist. Another is that it pretends that there is experience that cannot be understood across racial group lines. As if a white person, as if, by the way, there's nothing particularly complex about Amanda Gorman's poem. I mean, it's not as if there are sort of subtleties about it that, that need to be teased out. Uh, most of it could be translated by a uh, high school student who knew, was proficient in a couple of languages. No, what this says is that the thought of a black writer is, is of a kind that a white translator couldn't appreciate. Well, in that case, white people and black people can't understand each other. And where do you think that will go? You know, this is the darkest road, and it's be we are being led along it by people who pretend to be anti-racists. And they're not. They're racists. They're racists. They happen to have come along this time under the guise of anti-racism, but they're racists. If they think that white people and black people cannot understand each other and we cannot speak across boundaries, then there's nothing left but war, hatred, oppression, bigotry, and much more. And I think that anyone, black, white, any other color, should say, no, we're not doing that. We're sitting this one out. In fact, we're going to do more than sit this one out. We're going to fight back at that. We're not going to play that game. We know where it leads, even if you don't. So I very much hope that people realize what these so-called anti-racists are doing, the walls that they're building, the divisions that they are embedding and forcing on a new generation of Americans. And I hope that more and more Americans just step away from that, opt out of it, and call it out.